It's Monday, March 21st, 2011. In this week's Speaker Beat, the catastrophe in Japan is having an impact on the life sciences community. More on that. Plus, has Yoko Ono infiltrated a pharma giant? How Pfizer could go the way of the Beatles and break apart? And it's tax season, so how about a break? As in a permanent break. See how device makers hope to get one soon. All that and more on this week's edition of Beaker Beat, brought to you by Novo Nordisk. To learn more about Novo Nordisk, visit their company webpage on Beaker.com. Hello, Roy. Welcome to this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for tuning in. Well, it is officially spring, allegedly. So you know what that means. Time for some spring cleaning. And it looks like I've got plenty of work to do. Ugh. Jeremy, you have to help me. Our top story this week, the tragedy in Japan and its impact on the life sciences industry. The 9.0 magnitude earthquake and subsequent tsunami that struck Japan could impair several major U.S. medical device makers and drug makers, which have operations in the country. In fact, device makers alone employ more than 13,000 workers. Asian regulatory firm Pacific Bridge Medical said Japan ranks third globally when it comes to medical device market size at just under $25 billion, accounting for about half of the total Asia-Pacific market. Boston Scientific derives about 13% of its total global revenues from its business in Japan and has its Asian Pacific headquarters in Tokyo. In 2010, the company reported just shy of $1 billion in sales for its Japanese unit. A spokesman for both sides said the company reported no employee casualties in Japan and that it continues to assess whether the disaster will affect its operations in the country. Other companies with a big presence in Japan include Abbott Labs, which reported more than $2 billion in sales in Japan during 2010 and has grown its business there by 60% in the past three years. St. Jude Medical, Medtronic, Covidian, and Stryker also have a strong presence in Japan. Meanwhile, in the U.S., experts are reassuring residents that little radiation will travel to the West Coast, despite prevailing winds over Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. But that hasn't stopped people from rushing to pharmacies for potassium iodide pills, which have long been used to prevent thyroid problems caused by radiation exposure. Together with Japanese companies ordering potassium iodide for their employees, the U.S. demand surge is fueling big sales for drug makers. The three FDA-approved suppliers of the drug say they're struggling to keep up with demand, that according to the New York Times. Quote, we've sold more in the past three days than we have in the past three years. That from Jim Small, president of Resta Farms U.S. Operations. As the L.A. Times reports, California residents have been hoarding the pills, figuring it can't hurt to use them as a hedge. However, potassium iodide isn't recommended until radiation levels hit a certain minimum threshold and levels aren't expected to approach that in the U.S. All right, Jeremy. Well, I guess we'll just start from the top here in this top box and start going through things. Silver Surfer. Eh, Give that away. In sync celebration photo album. Jeremy, is this yours? Have you been in my garage? Anyway, tell us what you think about this story or any story that you see in today's show. It's very simple. Click on the orange button below me. Box will pop up. Type in your comments. Send it to me. I promise I'll read and respond to every one of them. And the best response wins an in sync celebration photo album. <laughs> Fine. Take it. And when you're done watching Beaker B, check out Beaker's blog and find out just how many millions, yes millions, one CEO will take home after a merger. It will floor you, trust me. That story and more on Beaker's blog. You can be my Yoko Ono. You can follow me wherever I go. Could Pfizer be breaking up the band? A top executive at Pfizer says it's weighing all of its non-core businesses for possible sale. Bloomberg reports that investors are advocating a spin-off of its nutrition business in a deal that could be worth close to $7 billion. If Pfizer chooses to break itself up, the strategy could mean transactions that would divest businesses that account for 40% or $32 billion of Pfizer's $67 billion in annual sales. Plus, it would be the complete opposite from the buyout growth strategy of departed CEO Jeffrey Kindler. Kindler decided that, faced with the impending loss of patent protection for its mega blockbuster drug Lipitor, the company needed to buy smaller drug companies, build up its generics division, and snap up other businesses. New CEO Ian Reid is said to be considering the opposite strategy, retrenching back to its core pharma business. That's exactly what Bristol Myers Squibb has been doing, and its Mead Johnson nutritional spinoff was an example analysts used for Pfizer to imitate. Stay tuned for more on this story. Why does this rack thing look familiar? (laughs) Stay still. Stop it. Oh, yeah. Depending on how you look at it, Johnson & Johnson CEO Bill Weldon either took a 7% pay cut last year or he was wildly overpaid. Weldon saw his pay package drop as a nonstop parade of product recalls helped tarnish the company's reputation and overall sales declined for a second year in a row. 
Despite all that, he still earned close to $29 million and was praised by the board, which cited his leadership as a key asset. This is, remember, the same person who was in charge when the proverbial you-know-what hit the fan. J&J has shed $18.5 billion in market value since the beginning of 2009. Product recalls have hit medical devices as well as key products like Tylenol, leading some analysts to question the corporate culture that could lead to this mess. Reuters characterized the board's move as an apparent, quote, disconnect with a steady stream of bad news. Now, if you feel bad for Weldon, don't fret. The board is giving him a 3% pay hike for merit. Nice. Right, time for some quick hits now, and uh, first let's take a look at a box that says old magazines. Huh, Pamela Anderson, May of 96. Oh, there's a new movie coming out called Showgirls. Sounds promising. Eli Lilly has suffered a massive setback on the road to a potential blockbuster. Last week, the FDA chose to accept an expert panel's recommendation and reject Amavid. The drug was the first in Lilly's attempt to move beyond a series of late-stage setbacks. Lilly had agreed to pay up to $800 million to acquire Amavid's creator, Avid, late last year. The deal included $300 million up front and up to half a billion dollars in milestones. Amavid is a new molecular imaging agent that could revolutionize Alzheimer's diagnosis by detecting the presence of amyloid plaque in the brain. It's injected into patients who are then given a PET scan to detect plaque. Lilly is aware of the FDA's concerns and is working to resolve them. Takeda Pharma's diabetes drug Actos is now under a microscope of sorts. The drug has fared better than its controversy-plagued rival Avandia, but now European regulators have launched a formal probe into a potential link between Actos and an increased risk of bladder cancer. So far, no clear link between the drug and bladder cancer has appeared. According to the European Medicines Agency, the risk factor was noted early on, and regulators have been keeping an eye on the data since the drug was approved in 2000. Now an increase in spontaneous reports from the field prompted the EMA to look at the drug. Takeda is in the middle of a 10-year study of cancer rates in Actos patients. Actos and GSK's Avandia are in the same class of medicines. Avandia came under scrutiny for cardiovascular risks back in 2007, and last year was withdrawn in Europe and severely restricted in the United States. Amgen has agreed to buy a Pfizer manufacturing plant in Ireland, saving 280 jobs. The deal should close in the second quarter of the year. Amgen will manufacture Pfizer's products at the facility for an interim period, while Pfizer will lease a portion of the facility from Amgen for the time being. Plus, Amgen has expansion plans for the facility. Last year, Pfizer announced it would try to sell three of its Irish plants and has been working with IDA Ireland to find buyers. One down, two to go. Medtronic has officially opened its manufacturing facility, Medtronic Singapore Operations, which will help it meet future demand for cardiac devices in Asia. The Singapore facility will employ more than 120 people by year's end. According to research firm Frost & Sullivan, annual sales of medical devices in Asia Pacific will total about $6.3 billion by next year, accounting for a quarter of the global total. The company just recently announced its new company headquarters in Shanghai, so lots of action for Medtronic in the Far East. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation continues to support getting vaccines to children, but has taken that effort a step further. The Gates Foundation is investing $10 million in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina-based Liquidia Technologies, but this is the first deal in which it's taken an equity stake and acted like a venture capital firm rather than a charitable foundation. The foundation will take a seat on Liquidia's board. However, it will act as a non-voting member, choosing instead to observe and offer suggestions when necessary. Liquidia's print technology could be applied to vaccines for malaria. The company already has a collaborative agreement with the PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative in place. All right, time for Money Matters. And Oh, speaking of money, check it out. All my old cassettes here, Jeremy. Eddie Money. Bingo. Human Genome Sciences is paying $50 million up front and up to $445 million in milestones for development rights to a lead cancer candidate. Five Prime's FP1039 is described as a genetically engineered protein drug that prevents blood vessels from feeding tumors. The drug is in early stage trials for a variety of cancers, and Five Prime is preparing to begin mid-stage trials of the drug for endometrial cancer. Quest Diagnostics is buying Celera. The company's announced they have signed a definitive agreement that's worth $671 million, or $344 million net of cash and short-term investments. Quest will pay $8 for each share of Celera. The deal includes $327 million in acquired cash and short-term investments. So part of the spring cleaning process is to give stuff that you no longer need to people you know, people you like, maybe they can get some use out of it. There's also the part where you give stuff away that you no longer like to people you dislike. So, Jeremy, here, i got some socks for you. There's some holy socks, some ugly ties, some ugly Clemson gear that Tracy gave us. These shorts have a hole in them. So, here, take them. Take them. They're for you. Take them. Take them. Take them. 
Spring is also a time to do taxes, which no one really likes. Wouldn't it be nice to get some more tax breaks and credits? The device industry agrees and they may get what they're asking for. In an effort to regain a competitive advantage on India, China, and other foreign markets, Congressman Kevin Brady and Eric Paulson have introduced the American Research and Competitiveness Act. This bill, if passed, would increase the tax credit for research and development from 14% to 20% and make it permanent in the federal tax code. With the arguments swirling around Washington, D.C. and the life sciences industry around jobs, reinvestment, and innovation, this initiative would look to spark productivity and investment in the U.S. through a provision that rewards companies for R&D spending. As expected, AdvaMed is supporting the measure. President and CEO Stephen Ubble said, quote, American tax policy must sufficiently support research and development for industries like medical technology to level the playing field with foreign governments eager to attract American jobs and develop homegrown competitors to American firms. Think of it this way. If Uncle Sam is bailing out banks and car companies all in the name of jobs and the economy, why can't he help companies who are innovative and play by the rules? These aren't handouts given to poorly run companies. They're incentives to help the industry grow and create more jobs. Sounds like a good idea to us here at Beaker. What do you think, Jeremy? I don't know. These are so last week. Probably just get rid of them. That's it for this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Sit, Beaker. Sit. Good dog. Hello, Mike. How are uh. you? Why are your friends? Why don't you wear us anymore? Give me a kiss. <laughs> I should have totally not given you this stuff. I knew something bad would happen. We are Mike Socks. <laughs>